will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the woman checks into a hotel. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, madam. Welcome to the Lane Hotel. Can I help you? Yes, please. I would like to check in. Certainly, madam. Can I take your name, please? It's Julia Olson. That's O-L-S-O-N. Thank you. Now, do you have a reservation and reference number? Yes, I booked with you online. My reference is EZPD 3729 Four, three, four. Which website did you book through? It was booknet.com. Ah, yes. Here's your confirmation. Mrs. Julia Olson. A single comfort room for three nights. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Now, you've filled out all your personal details online, so we just need to know how you'd like to pay at the end of your stay. And we'll also need to swipe your credit card. Here's my credit card. And I'd like to pay with it as well. Thank you very much. Now, the daily rate for your room is $122, including breakfast. I thought it was only $120 a night. Yes, that's the basic charge, but there's a $2 a night local hotel tax. If you look at your reservation printout from your website, it says that just under the reference number. Ah, oh, yes. That's fine, then. Here's your credit card back, Mrs. Olson. Thanks. So, your room number is 405 and here's your key card. Your room is on the fourth floor. Will it be possible for me to have an alarm call every morning that I am here, as I will need to get to some early meetings? Certainly, Mrs. Olson. At what time would you like the calls? At 6 a.m., please. That's fine. The staff on duty in the morning will see to that. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Actually, I wonder if you could help me with one or two things? Of course, Mrs. Olson. As I said, I have some meetings in town. Each morning the meetings are at 9 a.m. The first day I need to be downtown at Chrysler Street, and the second morning I need to get to the company based in the Lincoln Business Park, and on my last morning I need to be at the Green Hotel near the airport. I was wondering what the best way of getting to these different places would be. I thought about renting a car. That's certainly one possibility, but the meeting downtown would be tricky with a car because of all the parking restrictions downtown. The hotel here is about a 10 minute walk from the subway station and you can take a train downtown. Although to get to the Chrysler Street station, you'll need to change twice. What I'd do is catch a bus. There's a stop right outside the hotel and an M bus will take you all the way there without any changes. That sounds perfect. I don't want to be stuck looking for parking in a strange city. How long would the bus take? Around 40 minutes. That's fine. It'll give me some time to go through some papers on the journey. How about the Lincoln Business Park? That's a bit trickier. There are no links there from near this hotel, although it's not really that far. By bus or train, you'd have to go into the city and then out again. It's not that far on foot, actually. But if you're lazy, your best bet would be to get a taxi. There are always taxis at the hotel, and it would be just a 10-minute ride from here, and you could call one from the offices that you're visiting for your return trip. We have a list of local taxi companies that we can give you. Walking would be fun, but I'll be short on time, so I think a cab for the second day. How much would a cab be for that journey, do you think? It would cost $15 each way. And the last morning and the journey to the Green Hotel? Will you be flying out of the airport after the meeting? Yes, just after lunch. We run a complimentary shuttle bus to the airport every half an hour, and that takes 35 minutes. It stops right outside the airport building. You could check out from here, take your bags with you on the shuttle bus, leave them at the left luggage, and then the Green Hotel is easily accessible, as it's within the airport building itself. Is there anywhere I can have lunch after my meeting at the Green Hotel? 
There's a great Indian restaurant five minutes walk from the Green Hotel, and that's where I'd go. They can tell you at the hotel which way to walk. Otherwise, the Green Hotel itself has a restaurant, of course, and the airport has a variety of places you can eat. Well, I think I'll follow your recommendations. Anyway, that's all. Thanks very much for your advice. You're welcome, Mrs. Olson. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear a woman giving an introductory talk before a tour of a big house called Gatfield Park. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the introductory talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this tour of Gatfield Park. As you will know, Gatfield Park is the ancestral home of the Gatfield family, and they have been living here for over 600 years. Today, I will guide you around the building, pointing out to you on the way all the particular points of interest. Before we start, I would like to give you a brief overview of where we will go and what you will see. So right now at the start of the tour, we are in the entrance hall where visitors to Gatfield Park would arrive and be met. You can see that the first thing that strikes you are the fine paintings hanging here, but we will go more into those in just a minute. From here, we will move to the right, into the Great Hall, which is where the Gatfield family would entertain and dine or lunch with their guests. It's an enormous room that can sit up to a hundred people. You will not be surprised to hear that the family rarely eat there now. Nowadays, they eat in a more normal-sized dining room adjacent to the kitchen, which is all part of their private apartment in the left wing of the house. We will avoid the family's private rooms, but they are not of interest, as they are merely the modern day rooms that resemble the usual living spaces of the average family today. After the Great Hall, we will go through a series of reception rooms. These are decorated in a most flamboyant manner and reflect the different ages that the house went through. From the reception rooms, there are fine views out over the garden towards the monument in front of the forest. From the main reception room, big double doors open out to the garden so that summer parties could be held both indoors and outdoors. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the introductory talk and answer questions 16 to 20. After the reception rooms, we will pass into the library, where you will see the family's collection of over 4,000 books, some of which are extremely rare and valuable. There is also a lot of the china for which Gatfield Park is so justly famous. After the library, we will have a quick view of the billiard room, this is where the gentlemen of the house would play snooker or billiards in the evening and smoke their cigars and drink their brandies. After the billiard room, we will go upstairs and look over the bedrooms and bathrooms. Again, we will have a window into the past, albeit a very wealthy past. You will see rooms decorated to the most lavish degree. The most impressive is the master bedroom of Lord Gatfield, which is larger than the average family's floor space in their house. You will see the antique furniture, carpets and the superb view over the gardens. 
When we have finished looking at the bedrooms and bathrooms, we will look at the behind the scenes areas that most people do not think about nowadays. For houses of this size, a large staff was required to clean, cook, serve and garden. These people had to live, work and sleep as well at Gatfield Park, so you will also see their rooms and the back corridors, kitchens, laundry rooms, storerooms, amongst others. After the tour of the inside of Gatfield Park, you will be at liberty to wander around the gardens until 5pm, which is when Gatfield Park closes. There are two small shops at the main gateway entrance. If you get hungry, there is a small cafe that sells hot and cold food, along with drinks, and also a gift shop where you can buy souvenirs of the house and literature on the house and local area. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. You will hear two students discussing the assessments in their business course. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Hey, Mark. Oh, hi, Don. Have you got over that cold yet? Yes, I got over it by sleeping all day yesterday and skipping my meals. So I'm much better, thanks. Did you go to that workshop on assessments for the business course yesterday? Yes, I did. I made notes for you as I knew you weren't there. We can go through them now if you want. Hmm, that would be really helpful. Well, they let us know about all the assessments for this year. As you can see, I've broken it down into assessments for semester one and assessments for semester two. Uh, do you know the dates for the semesters? Yes, yeah, semester one is from the beginning of October to the end of January. Semester two is from the middle of February to the middle of June. Good. Now then, let's look at the first semester. The assessments on our options for the first semester are divided up into three. There are all the essays and presentations that you do over the semester, and then there are some exams in the second half of January for two weeks on all the options that you've chosen. The five options of the first semester have two essays and two presentations each. As our option, finance, is not really an essay subject, we get to do two case studies instead of presentations. The options have one exam each. Ah, so I've got five options like you, so I have five exams, is that right? Sort of. All the options have one exam each, but accountancy has two. I do accountancy and you don't, so I get to have one more than you. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> exactly. So we share the other four options in the first semester. Marketing, economic, strategic planning and finance. Uh, what about deadlines? They aren't out yet. They say that the deadlines will be orally given when the essays are set by the teachers. After that, the teachers will individually post the given deadlines on the department website. Not on the department notice boards. Not this year. They've phased that out as it's too old-fashioned. Mm, anything else about non-exam assessments? Just that there is now a new standard procedure for essay layout. It covers things like how to do citations and bibliographies, page numbering, cover pages and things like that. Word limits will be the same though. Mm. Can we give in our essays by email this year? Unbelievably, the essays all still must be submitted on paper in the individual teacher's pigeonhole. And they're living in the Stone Age sometimes. I know. They did say that attachments will be acceptable next year, though. That's about time. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. 
So what about the exams? They said that they would give us more help with preparation this year, after the awful results last year. They've done a number of things. First of all, the week before the first and second semester exams, we've got a reading week. There are no classes at all in this week, apart from two optional seminars on exam techniques. Well, that's a good start. Anything else? Yes, because of the heavy maths element in some of the courses, there are extra help lessons in maths. These are going to be at the end of the usual working day, from six o'clock to half past seven. There'll always be three teachers who will be there to teach or revise all the math skills that will be needed to get through the exams. Oh, that will be really useful for me. I mean, I'm not bad at maths, but some of the things that they do in economics stretch me too far. There'll also be extra help in all the other classes. The department is setting up what they are calling academic labs. Each week, all the teachers will provide a one-hour slot, either before class at half past seven in the morning, at lunch break, or after classes are over. In these labs, the teachers can explain again concepts that the students haven't understood or look at problems with assignments. Oh, it seems like they're taking things seriously this year. I know. It's a good thing. Another thing that they've done is that there'll be an electronic help desk available for four months. You can email your academic problem and an administrator will forward the mail to an appropriate teacher. This is just a trial project, though, to see if it works. How do we get the email address for the help desk? It's on the business department website. Finally, the Students' Union has engaged more access to counsellors to help students have problems with stress. In that way, the students can get help and deal with their emotional problems rather than just dropping out of the course. Well, that's a lot of new information. Thanks a lot. Shall we go and get a cup of tea before we look at semester two? That's a good idea. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear part of a lecture on environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Vostok Station is located on the Antarctic continent. It is the coldest place on Earth, with temperatures recorded of minus 76 degrees centigrade. Extreme winds hold sway, along with zero humidity, and a lack of oxygen comparable to that at an altitude of 16,000 feet. Russian expeditions either get to the Antarctic by sea and then trek, although this takes several months. Alternatively, they can fly more cheaply and safely from South Africa, but there are only 10 to 12 of these special flights per year, and only during the three short months that the weather is good enough for the trip to be made. At Vostok Station, planes cannot hang around. After two, or at the most three hours, the plane has to depart. If it gets colder than minus 56 Celsius, the plane cannot take off, even in windless weather as the skis won't work. At that temperature, the snow freezes into tough, sandpaper-like grit, which inhibits takeoff and landing, and for nine months a year Vostok Station is at minus 60 or colder. The polar scientists who live at Vostok Station take a little time to acclimatise to the conditions. They say that within just a week and a half, their heads stop hurting, they cease to vomit, and they begin to be able to sleep. 
This is partially the reason there are only three permanent scientific bases deep in the Antarctic continent. At the South Pole, there are the American Amundsen-Scott base and the French-Italian base Concordia, and further east, there's Russia's Vostok station. Apart from being the coldest place on Earth, Vostok station has another reason why it is famous. In 1996, Russian scientists were drilling for oil, but they had only found ice core samples and worthless mineral deposits. When they reached 3,623 metres, they stopped because they couldn't figure out why the ice at such an extreme depth was so pure. After a series of tests using radar and seismic waves, it turned out that this ice was actually the uppermost region of the world's largest warm water subglacial lake, a lake roughly the size of Lake Ontario. The lake is composed of fresh water and has been isolated beneath the glacier for somewhere between half a million and one million years. Naturally, the first thing that came to the scientists' minds was that this lake could possibly be the most pristine liquid environment on Earth and could be full of living creatures and organisms that, due to isolation and adaptation, live nowhere else. Researchers tested the core samples taken close to the water and indeed found microbes that have never been found elsewhere. Scientists say that the lake could also shed light on the origins of the Earth and life on Earth. But when the question of how to explore the lake came up, the Vostok scientists faced a serious dilemma. The lake is under immense pressure and to breach the ice would have devastating consequences. Anything sent into this pristine environment would have to be as sterile as possible to avoid contamination. To get to the lake, 3,623 metres of ice have to be drilled through. This ice itself is around 420,000 years old. The top of the lake has a layer of frozen lake water before the liquid fresh water is reached. At the bottom of the lake there is a sediment layer. The lake is enclosed by bedrock on all sides and underneath. Russian scientists have now reported that they have successfully drilled to the surface of the lake and pierced the ice sheet. However, many in the scientific world are concerned about their method, which entails using kerosene to keep the borehole open. The fear is that only taking samples from the top of the lake will be insufficient for proper analysis, making the possible contamination a large risk with little benefit. The concern is that a mere surface sample will tell scientists nothing regarding the depth of the lake or anything about the sediment, which could hold vital information and that the kerosene could compromise the samples and skew data. A way to combat this problem could come from NASA, which has approved funding for the development of a torpedo-like probe, dubbed the cryobot. Equipped with a heated tip, the probe is designed to slowly melt its way down through a glacier, unwinding communication cables as it goes. As cryobot ventures down, the water would refreeze behind and above it. Then, before it breaches the ceiling of the lake, the probe would decontaminate itself with a hydrogen peroxide bath. Once inside Lake Vostok, Cryobot could release the remote-controlled Hydrobot, a specially designed submersible vehicle equipped with a camera and other instruments to explore the interior of the lake. However, whether NASA will allow the Lake Vostok Russian scientists to use NASA equipment remains to be seen. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.